Good morning, everybody, and welcome to the College of Arts and Sciences virtual three-minute thesis competition. My name is Dr. Dean Lethe. I'm the director of choral activities here at the uh, CAS School of Music. I'm also an associate professor, and I'm very excited for all of these 3MTs today. The three-minute thesis, or 3MT, is as it's, as it's called for short, is a research communication competition developed by the University of Queensland in Brisbane, Austria. PhD competitors must present a compelling oration of their thesis and its significance. To throw a wrench into the things, the competitors have three minutes and not a second more to share their thesis, or 3MT. If the competitors keep talking, they are disqualified. Please note that a three minute countdown timer will be displayed uh, both here for the competitors and out there for the audience. If a technical complication happens during the competition, due to no fault of the competitor, the person will be allowed to restart their 3MT. 3MT is not an exercise in dumbing down the research, but challenges the student to consolidate their ideas and research discoveries so they can be presented to a non-specialist audience. The first place winner of today's competition will receive a $1,000 award. The college's second place winner will receive a $750 award, and the People's Choice winner will receive a $500 award. To vote on the People's Choice Award, ballots will be handed out directly following the competition, and that's for you all here in attendance. Perhaps even more important, the winner from today's competition will represent the College of Arts and Sciences at the University 3MT event, which will be held on Wednesday, March 29th at 1 p.m. right here in the Spark Atrium. The winners from each college will compete for prizes that are a lot higher. The winner receives $3,000, second place $1,500, and $500 for the third place prize. More on the three-minute thesis can be found at 3mt.wsu.edu. Now it's time to meet the judges and then the competitors. Let's thank the following judges. First, we have Katie Cooper. She is the Associate Dean for Faculty in the College of Arts and Sciences. In this role, she supports the recruitment, retention, and professional development for all faculty within the college, including working to build more inclusive practices into the key processes associated with the faculty career progression. She is also uh, excuse me, she is also an associate professor in the School of the Environment where she researches fundamental outstanding questions about planetary evolution, including why is plate tectonics operating on Earth, but not other, pl uh, but not other planets? Why are there regions of the Earth that have resisted the destructive forces of plate tectonics for billions of years? And what can these areas tell us about the history of our planet and perhaps others? Let's hear it for Katie Cooper. J.J. Hardy is an engineering technician for the Department of Fine Arts. In his position, J.J. works hands-on with the students in the Fine Arts 3D area to help construct physical objects based on conceptual ideas. He runs several areas in the department, including a wood shop, metal shop, foundry, and digital fabrication lab. J.J.'s personal artwork currently, currently focuses on consumer objects that are either abandoned or obsolete and then are reworked into something new. J.J. Hardy, everybody. Laura Kuhlman is an assistant professor in the Department of English. Dr. Kuhlman currently teaches American literature, mythology, research-based writing, and composition courses. She was a three-minute thesis finalist in 2016 while she completed her a work on her PhD at the University of Iowa, and she is thrilled to be joining the panel of 3MT judges here at WSU. Let's welcome Laura Kuhlman. And last but certainly not least is Courtney Meehan. Uh, she is the Associate Dean for Research and Graduate Studies. In her role as Associate Dean for the College of Arts and Sciences, Dr. Meehan fosters research, scholarship, and creative activity for faculty in the arts, humanities, social sciences, life, and physical sciences. She is also a professor in the Department of Anthropology, where she utilizes an evolutionary life history approach to understanding how early environments influence child development, human milk composition, and maternal infant microbiome. Biomes. Let's welcome Courtney Meehan. 
These judges will be giving their scores based on comprehension and content, as well as engagement and communication, independently via an online form. After the seven competitors are finished, the scores will be collected and tallied. The average for each will give us a clear winner. In the case of an apparent tie, the highest score in the comprehension and content section will be the winner. The decision of this adjudicating panel will be final. And now for our competitors. Listed in randomized order uh, that they will present, please hold your applause until the end. Paula Kimmeling, Department of Mathematics and Statistics. Alexa Lambros, Department of Psychology. Mahidi Hassan, Department of Mathematics and Statistics. Aveline Dalen, Department of Anthropology. Arpita Sina, Department of Anthropology. Amanda Hussein, School of Languages, Cultures, and Race. Osdran Soma, Department of Sociology. Inru Chen, School of Politics, Philosophy, and Public Affairs. Praveer Tiwari, Department of Physics and Astronomy. Let's thank all of our competitors for being here today. After all competitors are finished, the judging is complete, and we have the results. I will announce the winners. Now, without further ado, let us turn over to competitors, starting with Paula Kimmerling, and the title of her presentation is Quantum Walks on Dutch Windmill Graphs. Hello, my name is Paula Kimmerling and I'm a fifth year PhD candidate in the Department of Mathematics and Statistics. Today I'm gonna to talk to you about quantum walks on Dutch windmill graphs. So to do that, I need to answer at least two questions. What is a graph? And what do I mean by the phrase quantum walk? Now, a graph is this mathematical structure that's on the right-hand side of the screen. It's a collection of vertices, or sometimes we call them nodes, connected together by edges. This graph in particular is part of a family that has two parameters, the number of blades in it, because it kind of looks like a Dutch windmill, um, maybe, uh, <laughs> and the number of vertices in each blade, so parameters B and M. I can make these as big as I want to, doesn't really matter. Now, when I talk about a walk on a graph, I want you to picture, I'm gonna start on one node, so let's randomly pick five. I'm gonna start on node five, and I'm going to flip a coin with one, some probability I'm either going to walk to the node adjacent to it four, or I'm going to walk to six, but I'm only gonna walk to one of them. A quantum walk is special in that when I go to walk to some neighboring vertices, I'm actually going to walk to all neighboring vertices at the same time, kind of like we're playing Twister. Um, it gets more complicated the more times I end up flipping my coin to try to see how, many, how far I'm gonna go. And because of this, I want to study the average probabilities that information is gonna travel around the graph given where it started. That's where this pretty matrix comes in. And it's color-coded based on the probability entries if I have relatively low entries, that's the dark purple and black, the brightest entry is about 0.35. So it doesn't have um, a large probability of starting and staying anywhere, but the highest probability is at that central vertex zero. In general, we've noticed or we've concluded that these types of graphs are not good at translating information from one node far across the graph. So a node, something that starts on node one is not likely to get to node eight, because the one eight entries are pretty dark, but something that starts on node one and translates to node three, the one three entries are pretty bright. So it'll try to hop between those two things. Um, so it's not good at long distance transmission of information, but it'll keep stuff pretty localized. This is true if I increase both parameters M and B, so that was pretty exciting when we proved that. And ongoing research is to try to find other similar symmetric graphs that exhibit similar behavior um, and get a more general result from that. Thank you. Everybody, let's thank Paula Kimmerling. 
Our next contestant is Alexa Lambros, who will present on the role of adversarial allegiance in Atkins v. Virginia cases. In the 2002 case of Atkins v. Virginia, the Supreme Court held that it's cruel and unusual punishment to sentence defendants with intellectual disabilities to death. These defendants are less effective at things like processing information, communicating, and controlling their impulses. This means they may present poorly in court or fail to meaningfully assist their lawyers, which puts them at risk of wrongful execution. The Atkins case led to three criteria that courts use to decide if a defendant has an intellectual disability. An IQ at or below 70, impaired adaptive functioning, which is the ability to complete tasks of daily living, and onset of disability in childhood. Forensic evaluators play a central role in Atkins cases, so their impartiality is crucial to a fair trial. But I hypothesized that experts in these cases display evidence of a phenomenon called adversarial allegiance. In other words, I believed that Atkins experts are inclined to reach conclusions supporting the party that hired them, the defense or prosecution. To test my claims, I searched LexisNexis's legal database for a variety of variables uh, and cases that um, basically that included uh, IQ scores and or overall conclusions for uh, one or more experts for both the defense and prosecution. I then qualitatively coded these cases um, for a variety of aspects of uh, the cases related to Atkins criteria. Ultimately, I found evidence of adversarial allegiance in all examined aspects of these cases. Compared to defense experts, prosecution experts reported higher average IQ scores, were less likely to find that a defendant had adaptive behavior limitations, and were less likely to assert that their disability began in childhood. Most notable, though, is what's shown in my visual. Prosecution experts were significantly less likely than defense experts to find and ultimately testify that a defendant is intellectually disabled. In other words, prosecution experts were significantly more likely to find results suggesting that a defendant is eligible for the death penalty. These results strongly suggest that in these life or death cases, adversarial allegiance introduces bias into expert witness testimony. The intent of the Atkins standard is to protect members of a vulnerable population, but if experts can't determine who belongs to that population objectively, then the standard is ineffective. This highlights the importance of continued research on adversarial allegiance in Atkins cases. Thank you. Everybody, let's thank Alexa. All right, thank you very much. Next up, we have Mahidi Hassan. His presentation is about change point detection on dynamic network using RDPG. Thank you. I'm Mahidi, I'm Mahidi Hassan, fourth year PhD student in the Department of Mathematics and Statistics. Let me begin by asking a question. How many of you have uh, some sort of social network account? Almost all of us. If we look at our own network, we will see we are connected to our family members, friends, and people from different other places and perspectives. And of course, not all of the people are equally important to us, and our relationship change over time. So this is not, this is not true only for the social network. Other examples are biological networks, sensor networks, such as cybersecurity network, power grids, transportation network, just to name a few. So when we study such network, we want to capture their complex dynamics and preserve their network structure so that we can study their relationship better. And in any such cases, a network forms with two primary components, an edge, are an, uh, edge and nodes. So a node, sort of an agent, which could be an individual, a variable, a city, or maybe a country. And an edge represents the connection between two nodes. 
Now suppose we have a complete network structure of a system like that. What would be interesting to see? We might be interested to see who is connected to whom, who is most influential in the network, and if we have any sort of cluster or community structure in the network. However, our network that we are interested about is dynamic in nature. So that means we will have sequence of network stream over time, like the graph down that. So what we can do with that dynamic network? In a dynamic network, generally, any change at any time signals some sort of anomalies or abnormalities. For example, in the power grid network, any abrupt change in the network flow signals some sort of disruption. So if we have a tool or an algorithm which can detect that change precisely, that would be very useful for taking an immediate action to alleviate that problem. But the most challenging part of that is, depending on the size and the complexity of the network, our data metrics could be tremendously large. And processing that data in real time and allowing the interaction among all different nodes would be a real challenge. So I'm working on developing an algorithm which can detect any change points, any significant change point that happens on the online stream of network and where that change happens in the network. So our target is to have the algorithm which will be associated with the system and would allow us to get change points in real time. Thank you so much. Let's thank Mahidi Hassan. Our next contestant is Aveline, uh, excuse me, Aveline Dalen, whose presentation is titled Illness, Animals, and Reading Minds. If I had told you in our pre-pandemic lives that one bet could change the course of history, you would have thought that I was crazy. Yet a little over three years ago, one sick creature drastically changed human life around the globe. Worldwide, there are over 300 million food animals, over 1 billion pets, and over 80 billion, sorry, over 80 billion food animals. But those animal diseases transfer to us through human-animal contact. While obviously we cannot eliminate all animals to reduce disease risk, nor can we prohibit people from interacting with them. So what can we do to prevent the next pandemic? My research starts at the premise that those most crucial to the solution aren't scientists, but animal owners and caretakers. Their first response has the capacity to heal or worsen animal sickness, and as a result, prevent or promote disease outbreaks and pathogen spillover. In theory, improving animal health at the local level thus prevents pandemics. But in reality, the situation is a lot more complex. What people consider a sick animal is extremely subjective because how people interpret and make sense of disease is cultural rather than universal. Our medical habits are different all around the world because they are informed by cultural beliefs and norms about what causes disease, how we think the body functions, and what we consider a healthy person. What it means to be a sick human or animal in one culture may be completely different in another. My research develops a cognitive method to, metaphorically speaking, get into the minds of animal caretakers and understand how they make sense of sickness. I am researching, collecting, and analyzing people's experience with animal disease, the steps they take to address it, and the reasons guiding their actions. My aim is to create a book and turn my model into a framework and template for other researchers. Viewing illness through the eyes of others allows us to offer appropriate health intervention in ways that fit rather than collide with people's cultural lens. And this approach, I believe, is the key to preventing the next pandemic and to ensure a healthier future for humans and animals alike. Thank you. Let's thank Aveline Dalen, everybody. Up next, we have Arpita Sina, 
who will present on the glamorous working body fashion modeling in India. Hi. I would like to start with the pictures that you see here. I took them during my field work in India in one of the fashion weeks that I was covering. Uh, so these are the scenes from on site, some backstage, some on ramp. I have been a fashion model myself for over eight years, and to see some of my uh, colleagues go about with their work from a different vantage point was rather an interesting experience. Fashion modeling is often considered aspirational. It is associated with glitz and glamour and fame and money. While this might be true for some top tier of models, but let me assure you, that is not true for a vast majority of them. They are more likely to face exploitation, uh, job discrimination, and job insecurity. And these often goes unnoticed and unreported. Whatever little conversation that exists ends up being in gossip columns and not in academic writing. Whatever little work that currently exists in academia mainly focuses on the global north. This is where my research intervenes. My research focuses on the modeling labor in the Indian subcontinent. So what is modeling labor? To Understand that, let's just go through what a model has to go on a regular life to keep up with a job. A model has to look good, has to have the desirability quotient, has to remain marketable, and has to constantly socialize in parties because interpersonal relationships end up becoming more important than being good at your job. So I argue that the body becomes a very important form of labor so important that this labor can have serious health and mental illness to an extent that this can have serious impact in them in their later form of life because this can be a short-term career. So what I argue is that the vast majority of models do not have the negotiating power to change the, to change the circumstances they are put in. I use the ethnography, I use my autoethnographic uh, uh, approach to leverage my understanding of the in uh, insidership knowledge as well as I also use uh, a lot of uh, interviews. In general, I would like to contribute to the current body of scholarships which will help us address the systemic industry-wide problem better. Thank you so much for listening. Let's thank Arpita Sina. Next up, we have Amanda Hussein, and she will present on memory in the master's house. John Adams had Abigail. Franklin Roosevelt had Eleanor, and Barack Obama has Michelle. We know the names of these women due to their not only being the wives of former presidents, but also due to their contributions towards this country in terms of memory and history. But what of the voices and the stories that history and memory have forgotten or silenced? Museums like the Legacy Museum, monuments like Brick House, as well as certain pieces of literature and film, possess a connection due to their being public narratives. Public narratives share a history and memory form. But what are the greater questions associated with these narratives? Whose history? Whose memory? Who decides? who narrates, who, in, who chooses what is included and what is not. And what does this mean regarding value and meaning for those stories and voices that are not included? The purpose of my methodological, of my analytical research using historical narrative and memory is to examine race and gender 
of how selected museums and monuments, literature and film, within the Dominican Republic and the United States function as forms of colonized consciousness, acts of resistance, or both. The methodology I utilize uses historical narrative and memory as a technique some of the theorists I employ are Patrick Hutton, who successfully blends the concepts of history and memory, Linda Hutchin, who blends what is considered history and what is considered fiction, and Paolo Freire, who is the father of the concept of colonized consciousness itself. Each of, the, each of these theories participates in a conversation regarding inclusion on the his, traditional historical narrative, as well as the implications of, regarding value for those who are not included. The results of my research should detail the importance of history and memory in terms of colonized consciousness, should provide representation for those voices and stories that are not included, and should give an ethical perspective of justice and an examination of injustice for the voices and the stories that have been forgotten and silenced. Thank you so much. Everybody, let's thank Amanda. Our next con contestant is Austrian Soma, and he will present on exploring the dimensions of support for climate mitigation and adaptation. Uh, thank you. Climate change is one of the most challenging problems to face humanity. We have collectively known about the problems of global warming and climate change for a long time, yet the problem still pr continues to exist. What is missing is political will and public support. My research aims to contribute to our understanding of the sociological and the political obstacles to address, addressing climate change. For a long time, tackling climate change has meant tackling the causes of climate change or focusing on climate change mitigation. For example, doing things to reduce greenhouse gas emissions, things like promoting renewable energy. The problem is that climate mitigation has been lacking universal support. What the graph on the top left shows is that climate mitigation has a lot of support from Democrats, but not a lot of support from Republicans. In other words, climate change has been lacking, um, climate change has been a politically polarized issue. The thing that is that as global temperatures continue to rise, and as oceans warm, and as we begin to experience more severe droughts and forest fires and flooding, people are beginning to discuss ways in which we can work to protect ourselves from the changing climate. Many people who at one point may not have not been concerned about climate mitigation may now be more interested in climate adaptation, which means addressing the symptoms of climate change, things like building seawalls, building stormwater basins, like green rooftops to lower temperatures. Research shows that climate adaptation is not a politically polarized uh, issue, unlike climate mitigation. Adaptation may be a uniquely non-polarized issue, if we look at the graph on the top right. Those interested in social justice recognize that climate change will first affect the poor, the marginalized, and the most vulnerable in society, whereas those Many on the right recognize that it makes sense to businesses and industry and the economy to take steps to protect from severe weather. The question is whether it is possible to increase over the overall support for both adaptation and mitigation by combining efforts in a way which will gain support from those on the left and those on the right. My research is based on two sources of original data, a survey of the US population and an experiment. The survey helps us get an understanding of where America stands, whereas the experiment helps us understand what can be done to influence support for climate change. My research aims to give leaders and policymakers additional tools to help solve one of the most challenging problems to face humanity. Thank you. Thank you, Austrian. Up next is Inu Chen who will be presenting on gender mainstreaming in Taiwan. Okay. Okay, so. Nice to meet you, everyone. I'm Ng Ru Chen, PhD candidate from PPPA. 
Thank you for being here to listen to my story, a personal story about how I was motivated by a simple question and came to WSU to find the answer. The story begins with a very simple conversation that I once had with my professor. We were talking about the gender equality in Taiwan, and the professor expressed her frustration about how gender mainstreaming fails to improve gender equality in Taiwan. So, what is gender mainstreaming? Gender mainstreaming is an international initiative that aims to install gender perspectives to all levels of the government. It's believed that the governments can provide better services with gender equal institutions. Taiwan has been implemented gender, gender mainstreaming since 2005. However, gender mainstreaming fails to reach its expectation. So why? Why gender mainstreaming doesn't work in Taiwan? This question has been lingering in my mind since then. And this question finally led me to quit my job, came to WSU, and chose gender mainstreaming in Taiwan as a topic of my dissertation. Now, from, based, my, based on my research so far, I can finally find some answers for my question. There are two critical factors to explain why gender mainstreaming couldn't work well in Taiwan. First, the context. Second, the design. First, the context. There are two contextual issues in Taiwan, political context and cultural context. For a political context, Taiwan is a newly democratized country. Taiwan is not democratized until 1987, which means that authoritarianism has left a strong impact on the government. For a cultural context, Confucianism counts. Confucianism has dominated Taiwan for, for a long time. Confucianism creates a systematic gender role system, which also leads to patriarchy. So political context and cultural context together significantly impede the implementation of gender mainstreaming in Taiwan, especially when gender mainstreaming is such a new and challenging idea. Second, the design. The design of gender mainstreaming as a public policy in Taiwan fails to form a workable policy mechanism. So of course, no public policies can be implemented effectively without a well-designed policy rationale. So to sum briefly, context and design are two critical factors to explain why gender mainstreaming couldn't work well in Taiwan. Thank you for your listening. Everybody, let's thank Inu Chin. Our final contestant of the day is Praveer Tibari with his presentation entitled Equation of State Inside Neutron Stars. Have you ever wondered what, what is the densest object in this universe? Any answers? Yes, I've also wondered the same thing. So, uh, do you know if you give the density of the densest object to your favorite baseball, it will outweigh the moon by 10 folds. Interestingly, the, this object has a very close relative, and that is on the tip of your fingers. Puzzled? Let me explain. All the matter around us is made up of atoms. These atoms are mostly empty, and right at the center of it is what is called as an atomic nucleus. These nucleus contain a very tightly packed neutrons and protons. The number of these neutrons and protons determine what kind of object you are looking at. For example, if you take an atom of silver and add exactly 32 protons and 57 neutrons, you will get gold. A great startup idea, I might add. So now if you keep adding protons and neutrons into this nucleus, and the nucleus size will increase keep adding lots of neutrons and some amount of protons until the size becomes the size of Seattle. What you get is a neutron star. This is the fascinating object that my research deals with. We realize that a nucleus and a neutron star has a lot in common. And that's why we combine findings from three different sources. The first source is the experiment that is done on a nucleus. The second source is the theoretical calculation that we do on neutrons. And the third source, and the most important one, is the observation that astronomers do while looking at neutron star. And why do we care about studying these neutrons? We care 
because this understanding is helping us develop affordable treatment to cancer patients. It's quite fascinating. And it can also determine the efficiency, cleaning efficiency of your favorite laundry detergent. So in near future, this understanding will only increase. And I'm hopeful that in near future, I'll be giving a talk telling you more about the interior of Newton stars. Thank you. Thank you very much, Praveer Tiwari. And thank you much, thank you to all our competitors. Let's give them all a round of applause, everybody. Congratulations. We will now give our judges a few minutes to compile the scores as we pass out the People's Choice Award ballots to audience members. Please complete these ballots quickly and we will collect and tally the votes. We will then be back to announce the winners after a short intermission. Thank you very much and hold on tight.
All right, everybody, we are ready to announce the winners. But before we do that, everybody, let's thank the judges, Katie, JJ, Laura, and Courtney for their work today. And to all of our contestants, thank you so much for your preparations and your, for, for your presentations today. Today's People's Choice winner and the winner of a $500 award is Paula Kimmerling. Would you please come up here? Congratulations, Paula. Our second place winner today and the recipient of a $750 award is Praveer Tiwari. Congratulations, Praveer. And so this year's 2023 3MT competition, uh, the winner not only receives $1,000, but will also be the uh, will also represent the College of Arts and Sciences on the March on March 29th at the University Level 3MT composition competition. This year's award winner is Alexa Lambros. Let's thank thank Alexa, everybody. Congratulations to all of our winners and congratulations to all of our competitors. Thank you very much, everybody. This concludes our event. Thank you very much.